To mark Remembrance Day, as part of the Heritage Theatre project here at the Webb Theatre, we've put together poems from World War I and World War II. Most of us are familiar with the well-known poets, but there were many from all branches of the services, and also from those who waited while their sons, daughters and loved ones were away. May Hill, a Lincolnshire housewife whose poems expressed the, the feelings and anxieties of those who waited at home. Her only son joined the Royal Air Force just before his 20th birthday and was killed by a bomb. William Walker, a Spitfire pilot from the Battle of Britain, survived being shot down. The poem was written in memory of his companions and is inscribed on the memorial wall alongside the names of the few. This wall is on the White Cliffs of Dover, just outside Folkestone. Eva Dobell, from Cheltenham in England. Eva joined the Voluntary Aid Detachment and nursed through the First World War. Her poems describe her experiences nursing the wounded and dying soldiers. Stanley Kirby. Stanley was a petty officer in the Royal Navy and very little is known about him. It is believed that he took part in the D-Day landings and his poem describes pulling men from the dirty, oily waters, watching them die on the decks of the ships and then burying them at sea. Mary Simon. Mary's father was a provost in the town of Dufftown, Scotland. Her poems are written in a broad Scottish dialect and tell of the enduring heartaches of those that are left behind. Wilfred Owen, MC, perhaps one of the best known of all the war poets, killed in action just seven days before the end of hostilities, and his poems describe the savage and harsh reality of war. Mary Wedderburn Canaan joined the voluntary aid detachment, served as a nurse, and eventually reached the high rank of quartermaster. Her fiancé also survived the war, but unfortunately died of the 1919 Spanish influenza epidemic. Francis Ledwidge. Francis hailed from County Meath, lived his boyhood in the hills of Slane. Described as poet of the blackbirds, killed at Passchendaele during World War I, and his poem describes a dream about one of the high kings of Ireland as he lay sleeping on the front line. Vera Britton. Vera joined the voluntary aid detachment nursed in England and France. After the war, she wrote about her experiences in the famous book, Testament of Youth. Writing this book led to her lifetime involvement with the pacifist movement. John Gillespie McGee. A pilot officer in the Royal Canadian Air Force, an Anglo-American, and on his seventh flight in a Spitfire, flew to 33,000 feet. This inspired the poem, High Flight. He flew in four convoy patrols and was killed in a flying accident in 1941, aged 19. We hope you enjoy these poems. Thank you. The Click of the Garden Gate by May Hill, 1891 to 1944. I hear the click of the garden gate, but it is not he. He comes no more, either early or late, to his dinner or tea. He is far away, in an Air Force camp, learning to fight. I wonder if his blankets are damp and if he sleeps well at night. Not 20 years when he went away, just a boy. He may never again come back to stay to delight and annoy. Will what he has gained balance what he has lost? He will change. Will his growth to manhood improve him most? 
or make him change. I open the casement into his room, so tidy and so neat. And the sun shines in and chases the gloom, and the wind blows sweet ready for him when, early or late, he comes back home to the sea. I hear the click of the garden gate, but it is not he. Our Wall by William Walker Here inscribed the names of friends we knew, young men with whom we often flew, scrambled to many angels high, they knew that they or friends might die. Many were very scarcely trained, and many badly burned or maimed. Behind each name a story lies of bravery in summer skies. Though many brave unwritten tales were simply told in vapour trails, many now lie in sacred graves, and many rest beneath the waves. Outnumbered every day they flew, remembered here as just the few. The pain and laughter of the day are done. So strangely hushed and still the long ward seems. Only the sister's candle softly beams. Clear from the church near by the clock strikes one. And all are wrapped away in secret sleep and dreams. Here one cries sudden on a sobbing breath. Gripped in the church of some incarnate fear. What terror through the darkness next? What memory of carnage and of death? What vanished scenes of dread in his closed eyes appear? And one laughs out with exalted joy. An athlete, maybe his young limbs strain in some remembered game and not in vain to win his side the goal. Poor crippled boy, who in the waking world will never run again. One murmurs soft and low a woman's name, and here a veteran soldier, calm and still, a sculptured marble sleeps and roams at will through eastern lands where sunbeams scorch like flame. By rich bazaar and town and wood-wrapped snow-crowned hill. Through the wide-open window one great star, swinging her lamp above the pear tree high, looks in upon these dreaming forms that lie so near in body yet in soul so far. As these bright worlds thick drone on that vast depth of sky. The Ensign and the Plank by Stanley Kirby When you've pulled a man from the freezing sea, all black with ship's oil fuel, you've cleaned him off, seen his wounds, and wondered what to do. You see the whiteness of his ribs, where steam has skinned him too, the guilt you feel when you look at him, feeling glad it wasn't you. And all you have to ease the pain is aspirin and God. You fear to look him in the eye, for the question you know will be there. The answer you know is certain death, and there's nothing more you can do. You light him a fag and give him your tot, as he looks for the rest of his crew. When you lay him down on the iron deck, knowing that's his lot, briefly wondering if you did right by giving him your tot. For the rest of the watch with a sailmaker's palm, with needle and the thread, you sew him in his canvas shroud with the rest of last night's dead. A dummy shell between their feet makes certain that they'll sink. You sit and sew till morning glow amid the mess and stink. By dawn's grey light you carry them aft to the ensign and the plank. The hands of watch gather around, all bleary-eyed and dank. 
Then the skipper with Bible says the sailor's prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, we hope you're really there. One by one, the dead are gone, slid from the greasy plank. The hands go forward, feeling chilled. Thinking of those that were slain, with certain knowledge in a while, we'll do it all again. Each one, still being alive, gives a silent prayer of thanks. Wondering, with a cold dark fear, will I be next on the plank? The Soldier's Cairn by Mary Simon Give me a hill with the heather on it, on a red sun dropping down, or the mists of the morning rising soft, with a reek o'er a wee grey town. Give me a how by the Lang Glen Road, for it's there mang the wind and fern. Do you mind on it, Will? Are you hearing, Dodd? Are we begging the soldier's cairn? Far away is the Flanders land, where Fremit France atween, but many a how of them be of the day has a hap of the Gordon green. It's them we count that's lying there, and it's nay with stain nor earn, but with breaking hearts and memory sair, that's where begging the soldiers cairn. Dun lach dun the dullin sings, and a can on an old sock tree. Where a wee loon's wannies hanging yet that's dead in Picardy. An elka win fay the convul's bro, bends I the boss o' vern. Where ince he fudded a name that knew, I'll read on the soldier's cairn. O oh, build it fine and build it fair, till it leaps to the moorland sky. More, more than death is symboled there. Then tears are triumphs by. There's a dream divine of a starward way our laggard feet would learn. It's a new earth's cornerstone we'd lay as we fashion the soldier's cairn. Lads in your plaidies lying still and lands we'll never see. This lonely cairn on a hemland hill is all that our love can do. And fine and bra will mak it a, but oh, my bairn, my bairn. It's a cradle's crin that I'll blad in to me for the soldier's cairn. Dulce et decorum est by Wilfred Owen. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep, many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod, all went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots, of gas shells dropping softly behind. Gas, gas, quickly, boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori.
Lamplight, December 1916 by May Wedderburn Cannon We plan to shake the world together, you and I, being young and very wise. Now, in the light of the green-shaded lamp, almost I see your eyes, light with the old gay laughter. You and I dreamed greatly of an empire in those days, setting our feet upon laborious ways. And all you asked of fame was cross swords in the army list, my dear, against your name. We planned a great empire together, you and I, bound only by the sea. Now, in the quiet of a chill winter's night, your voice comes hushed to me, full of forgotten memories. You and I dreamed great dreams of our future in those days, setting our feet on undiscovered ways. And all I asked of fame, a scarlet cross on my breast, my dear for the swords by your name. We shall never shake the world together, you and I, for you gave your life away. And I think my heart was broken by the war, since on a summer day, you took the road we never spoke of, you and I dreamed greatly of an empire in those days. You set your feet upon the western ways and have no need of fame. There's a scarlet cross by your breast, my dear, and a torn cross with your name. The Dead Kings by Francis Ledwidge All the dead kings came to me at Rosnery where I was dreaming. A few stars glimmered through the morn and down the thorn the dews were streaming. And every dead king had a story of ancient glory sweetly told. It was too early for the lark but the starry dark had tints of gold. I listened to the sorrows three of that era passed into song. A cock crowed near Hazelcroft, and up aloft dim larks wing strong. And I too told the kings a story of later glory, her fourth sorrow. There was a sound like moving shields in high green fields and the lowland furrow. And one said, we who yet are kings have heard these things lamenting inly. Sweet music flowed from many a bill, and on the hill the morn stood queenly. And one said, Over is the singing, and the bell bow ringing, whence we come. With heavy hearts we'll tread the shadows, in honey meadows birds are dumb. And one said, since the poets perished and all they cherished in the way, their thoughts unsung like petal showers inflamed the hours of blue and grey. And one said, A loud tramp of men we'll hear again at Rosnery. A bomb burst near me where I lay. I woke, so I'd stay in Picardy. Perhaps, by Vera Britton. Perhaps some day the sun will shine again, and I shall see that still the skies are blue, and feel once more I do not live in vain, although I feel bereft of you. Perhaps the golden meadows at my feet will make the sunny hours of spring seem gay, and I shall find the white may blossoms sweet, 
though you have passed away. Perhaps the summer woods will shimmer bright and crimson roses once again be fair and autumn harvest fields a rich delight although you are not there. Perhaps some day I shall not shrink in pain to see the passing of the dying year and listen to the Christmas songs again, although you cannot hear. But though kind time may many joys renew, there is one greatest joy I shall not know again, because my heart for the loss of you was broken long ago. High Flight by Pilot Officer John Gillespie McGee Jr. Royal Canadian Air Force, 1941 Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter's silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung, high in the sunlit silence, hovering there. I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind I've trod the high untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God.